Hello and welcome to Unstress. I'm Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Now, we are exploring fulfilling potential and when it comes to sport, uh, elite sportsmen and women are doing that in a very public way and it's literally worth millions of dollars and often viewed by millions of people. Well, my guest today is one of the world's leaders in sports medicine, Dr. Peter Bruckner. Now, I will let Peter give you his CV, and it's pretty impressive. He shares some great insights. Needless to say, when it comes to medical experts in Australia, or the world for that matter, Peter is up there with them. Now, when you think about public health messages over the last 40 years, you might be excused for feeling a little confused. And as you hear how how unhealthy we are as a society and how we're unhealthy we become, you might wonder what has been going on. And as you will hear, you are not alone. Apart from the wonderful insights into the world of sport, Peter also underwent a personal epiphany some seven years ago after many years at a very senior level in sports medicine. And at the age of 60, faced with some health challenges himself, Look, there is just so much in this episode. Let's get started. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Dr. Peter Bruckner. Welcome to the show, Peter. My pleasure. Peter, you've, you've had an amazing association with the elite sporting teams, and, uh, and I sense uh, from having just spoken to you a few times, you're a very modest man, but could you indulge us a little and give us a brief history of how you got into sports medicine and some of the teams and sports you've been associated with? Um, sure. Um, well, I, I guess, you know, I uh, was always a Sports always been my passion for some reason. I don't really know why. My parents are quite normal, and uh, they didn't have that uh, obsession with sport that I did. But right from a kid, I was always really interested in sport and uh, loved either you know playing or watching or reading about sport and so on. And uh, so I guess you know, no one was particularly surprised when I sort of got into uh, I finished my medical degree and finished up in sports medicine. And sports medicine was just sort of starting really in uh, in those days. And um, you know, I've been involved in, in sort of establishing sports medicine as a as a recognised medical specialty over the last uh, couple of decades and so on. So it's been quite a mm. interesting journey. But along the way, um, I started off uh, probably the first professional team that I got involved with was uh, is in the AFL in Melbourne. You know, if you're a sports doctor in Melbourne, you know it's hard to avoid the uh, the AFL. It was the VFL in those days, um, mm-hmm. which dates me a little bit. But uh, I was a club doctor at Melbourne for uh, for some years. Um, the uh, those the Melbourne supporters out there would uh, would realise when I say that uh, it was a long time ago when I say that uh, every year I was there we were in the finals and uh, that's happened <laughs> rarely for Melbourne in the last twenty or so years so that dates me a little bit so that was in the late eighties and um, and then around that time I got involved with a number of other uh, sort of uh, national teams swimming and, and hockey and then then sort of my first long association with the Olympic teams was uh, was in athletics. I was out the national athletics team doctor for 10 years right through the 90s and did a whole bunch of world championships and uh, Olympic Games. So I went to two Olympic Games, to the Atlanta Games in uh, 1996, and I was fortunate enough to be involved in the Sydney Olympics. I was actually manager of the track and field team for the Sydney uh, Sydney Olympics. So I'd sort of mm-hmm. having doctor, doctor and assistant manager in Atlanta. And uh, so that was a great, uh, great experience. Um then I took a bit of a sabbatical from uh, from teams. It was just it involved a lot of travel these uh, these teams. So uh, and my kids were sort of getting into teenage years. So I decided I'd have a few years off travelling um, and finish up doing a bit of uh, media work and sort of being a, on the boundary line for AFL games on the on ABC Radio and so on. So that was a uh, good mm-hmm. fun. Um, and then I got uh, sucked back into <laughs> into team sport uh, with the Socceroos. Um, after their uh, their 2006 World Cup uh, adventures, um, I took over after that and uh, did the next sort of World Cup cycle, the four years leading up to the 2010 World Cup. So mm-hmm. I was the Socceroos team doctor uh, in South Africa at that World Cup and uh, went straight from there to uh, to Liverpool in the Premier League. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> been approached by uh, by them. It's just one of those sort of random phone calls you get. <laughs> sort yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, would you be interested? And um, and I sort of, it wasn't really the right time for me from a family point of view, but it was it was a fascinating job. And uh, it was a new job that Liverpool had established, uh, the first time they'd ever had a sort of overall head of sports medicine and sports science. Up till then, they just had a, you know, a doctor and a physio and so on. So it was an opportunity to really uh, 
you know, make some changes and uh, some innovations. And, and uh, I'd always felt at the time that the Premier League, despite, you know, all its sort of money and, and glamour and so on, was actually well behind uh, the AFL and, and NRL and so on in, in Australia. And uh, so we introduced some of the uh, some of the things that we did here to the, to the Premier League. So that was uh, a couple of years at Liverpool. And then... Um, then the last uh, the last job I had was uh, with the Australian cricket team, and uh, that was from 2012 to 2017, um, well before their recent uh, indiscretions. But um, <laughs> which I, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Let's not go there. Clearly, clearly missing my moral guidance. But, Absolutely, um, yeah. Um, yeah. So that was uh, really the last uh, team job that, that I had, and uh, and now I've just uh, looked after a couple of local teams that I've always been involved with. Uh, here in Melbourne, but um, yeah, finished with uh, with the sort of the jet setting around the world with mm-hmm. uh, with mm-hmm. interns and so on. What an yeah. amazing journey! I mean, uh, AFL Aussie Rules, yeah. athletics, soccer, mm-hmm. football, as we call it, in, as they call it in England, and uh, and then on to cricket. And I guess peak performance is something that clearly would be the goal of every athlete, and certainly every elite athlete. What in in your experience? What are the key elements at that level to peak performance? Well, I mean, I think you know, basically, you've got to have some talent. I mean, you know, there's this this business of you know anyone can uh, can make it to the top. You know, if they do ten thousand hours of work and so on, that that's just not true. I mean, you've got to have some some talent. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But having said that, you know that that's only a, a, a you know, one element of, of the package, if you like, because I've seen so many talented people who haven't made it and, and people with less talent who uh, who have. But you've got to have a certain amount of talent. Um, really, the, the next is, is just a commitment to uh, to the level of, of training that you've uh, you've got to do. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's a massive uh, commitment to, to make it a top of professional sport. You know, you've really got to devote your uh, your life to it and you've got to be very, uh, very intent on, on, on making it, I guess. You can't be half-hearted about something like that. Then, so you've got to train, you know, incredibly hard, but you've also got to be uh, got to be smart about the way you train, and uh, and that's you know I, I think that's where we come in. That you know you mm. need guidance um, to uh, to train the right way. And it's not necessarily more is better. You've got to be uh, you've got to train smart. Sure, you've got to do volume, but you've also got to do uh, you know quality as well as as quantity. And the next element I think is 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 uh, avoiding injury mm. and. Uh, and that can be partly genetic, you know, because I think there are some people who are very resilient and there are others who are not, um, partly due to smart training. Uh, you know, a lot of injuries are caused by training, what are called training errors, you know, doing too much too quickly, uh, uh, increasing the amount of training, uh, you know, too rapidly and so on. Um, and and also, obviously, good care of your, your injuries. And again, you know, that's, uh, that's where... Uh, where the doctors and physios and, and other members of the sports medicine staff uh, come in. So, um, and then of course there, there's you know last but by no means least is the sort of the psychological aspects of, of peak performance and that uh, that ability to uh, to perform under pressure. Um, you know, be that uh, you know just even at a local level, you know, for big games or, or uh, you know even or at professional level where there's a lot of scrutiny on. Uh, you know, people say, oh, you know, it's great to be a you know. A, AFL footballer or a test cricketer in all the glamorous life and all that sort of stuff. But yeah. it, but with that comes a lot of pressure and expectation and everything you do is sort of, a, you know, examined under the microscope by by the media who, are, you know, who love to criticise. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's that ability to cope with that uh, that pressure. And uh, I think the best person I ever came across at, at doing that was Cathy Freeman. Oh, um, really? Okay. And there's, you know, because I don't think uh, in the history of the Olympics has ever been anyone under as much pressure as as Kathy was in that uh, that Sydney Olympics. You know, she was really the great uh, the great hope for of Australia in in the major sort of sport in the home Olympics. Uh, you know, that was all about Kathy Freeman. You know, you'll remember on you and mm-hmm. I can mm-hmm. enough to remember these things. You know, that was Freeman Night. You know, everyone talked yeah. about Freeman Night. And you know, did you have a ticket for Freeman Night, or where are we going to be on Freeman Night? You know, there were parties all over the country and so on. And, and then, you know, just to cap it off, you know, in case there was anyone in the country who didn't realise it was all about her, then they'll make her light the flame at the opening ceremony. So yeah. really there was incredible pressure on that, on Cathy and the expectation that, you know, everyone expected her to win. And she just had this wonderful ability to sort of tune out, really, just to go into her own sort of little world. And, and a lot of people sort of mistook that for, for being a little bit, uh, you know, um, 
not vague and, 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 you know, maybe not that smart and so on, but it was actually, that was her way of, uh, of coping with, uh, with the pressure. And she did it incredibly well. And, um, you know, as I said, I, I don't think there are too many people who could have coped with the pressure that, mm. that she is. So that, you know, she was a great example yeah. of uh, someone finding a way to cope with, uh, with enormous pressure. And, uh, well, I still have this image, as I'm sure every Australian does. It gave me a tingle down my spine when I visualised it with her and her green jumpsuit on or whatever it was yeah. and uh, and then uh, crossing that line in the 400 and wrapping that flag around her and oh geez I mean it was Sydney Olympics was an amazing thing for the world but for Sydney it was Australia it was incredible for Sydney it was incredible but to have it capped off with her winning you just couldn't have written a better story. No, nah, and it was amazing. I was very fortunate. One of my roles was, was basically to look after her for the you know the three or four hours after the uh, after the uh, the win, and uh, it was very interesting because you know never once did she say to me in that time, oh, "I'm so happy," you know that was all I've ever dreamed of. It's the best moment of my life. Blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. All she could say to me was, "I reckon she must have said it 15 times." She said, "Oh God, Doc, that's such a relief. Doc, I'm so relieved." <laughs> You know, it was. I mean, I'm sure, obviously, since you know, and, and we've spoken since, you know, that she's obviously very proud of what she did. But at the time, it was just enormous relief that she hadn't lost. You know, she hadn't <laughs> screwed up in front of the whole country. Yeah, yeah. And um, and from your perspective, you, know, you said I was looking after her for the last three or four hours, for the three or four hours after the event. What what sort of things were you looking for? Well, I mean, really, I was just as her, man, you know, mm. sort of managing the team. I mean, you know, initially you sort of take them through the media, and 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 then uh, yeah. then we, you know, I had to take her upstairs to get interviewed by Bruce, and and then we yeah. sort of, you know, caught up with her family, and then we did drug testing, and, and then we get ready for the ceremony, and and you know, all that sort of stuff. So there's mm. a bit of a you know a rigmarole that goes on uh, after you, uh, you know, after yep. you win a medal yep. and, uh, and so on. So yep. I was just her uh, her mind, and I remember thinking at the time, this is just bizarre. You know, we were sitting down there waiting for the drug test and we're just chatting about where we're going to go on our holidays or something after the Olympics. And I, I remember thinking, you know, this is pretty weird. You know, the whole country is going crazy and celebrating this <laughs> this win. And here am I sitting down there with this lovely girl, um, you know, chatting about our holidays. It was quite uh, And waiting for her to uh, urinate yeah. into a bottle. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, then, Look, you, know, you, you, you raised that issue about drugs in sport, and it's, it's clearly uh, there's clearly a spectrum, but it's also a big problem. Well, tell us a little bit about what are the issues? I mean, you know, obviously it's about improving performance, but it's not as simple as that, is it? No, look, it's a very complex issue, mm. uh, Ron, and you know, it's uh, it's. It's obviously one of the one of the major you know major issues. It has been for you know for thirty or forty years, and will continue to be you know because I think it's you know it's just human nature, unfortunately, that people will try always try and gain advantage, and there'll always be some people who who you know will will try and take that to the uh, to the limit. Um, you know, I don't believe that many people who who actually take drugs actually want to take the drug. And I think you know nearly everyone would rather there was no drugs, but. Mm. You know, I think a lot of people believe, and, and in some cases quite rightly, that their uh, their opponents are taking stuff, so they feel as though they sort of have to to, to keep up. So, you know, in a way, I, I'm sort of well, I'm you know, I, I won't say I'm sympathetic, but I can sort of understand why you know some in certain sports uh, that have a culture of, of drug taking, uh, um, you know, that uh, that there's a big temptation to to take it and. Uh, mm. So, you know, I think, you know, people sort of uh, say, well, just, let's just give up and, you know, have open slather and so on. And, and I don't think you can do that. I mean, I think you've got to have uh, have rules. You've got to uh, to test. You've got to find ways of uh, of reducing uh, drug or you know, preventing drug taking if you possibly can. Otherwise, the whole fabric of sport is uh, destroyed. But, uh, but the, you know, the, the reality is, is that the – the chemists are always going to be a step ahead of the testers, probably. Mm. Uh, but I guess good. I guess it's also uh, complicated in that these athletes are human beings, and uh, they may have asthma, or they may have uh, digestive issues, or they may have yep. an autoimmune condition, and yet they still want to compete. But they need some kind of medication to balance. This must be the grey area. This is a very difficult area, a uh, mm. very difficult area, and uh, and that's been the cause of a lot of controversy over the last few years about uh, these things called TUEs, which are basically you know, the athlete being given permission 
to uh, to take a banned drug uh, for their medical conditions, and that's very controversial. And um, you know that's been abused, unfortunately, uh, as these things tend to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think in theory, it's you know it makes a lot of sense. You know, if you if you need something for your blood pressure or for whatever, um, you know, you you should be able to take it. But uh, unfortunately, this is a grey area where uh, where people are you know people are always going to abuse those sort of uh, privileges. So it's it's very difficult. And um, and you know we. We have to be honest and say that we, you know, we, we still haven't won the battle against drugs, and we're probably never going to completely win it. But uh, that's not to say that we, you know, we shouldn't be very vigilant and, uh, and do everything we can to uh, to make sport as drug free as we can. Mm. Now you mentioned, um, you, you know, the, you've been involved with some pretty high profile uh, sporting people, and and these peak these team sports particularly reflect an incredible financial investment in individuals. I mean, it's kind of mind boggling, really. And yet they run out. They could run out onto the field on their first outing and injure themselves, and and that must be, I mean, the dollar signs must go up. Uh, how, and how that recovery is handled is literally worth millions, not to mention the future of the person itself. Uh, you mention avoiding injury. Well, yeah, okay, uh, but too much too quickly. What are some other elements about the recovery? Of an, of an athlete, particularly at that level, and, and do they differ? Very, oh, they must differ from sport to sport. Yeah, look, I think, you know, the, the basic principles of recovery are, are the same from sport to sport in, in that, you know, it's the, the athlete and, and, and the team will do everything they can to recover as quickly as possible because uh, the quicker you recover from uh, a hard match or a hard uh, competition or whatever, then the, the the sooner you're ready to resume training or, or resume competition, you know, you know, in some so let's take a, in a five day cricket test match, you know, you've, you've only got you know twelve hours or so to recover, you know, you've got to play the next day, um, and uh, and that's that's tough, you know, people sort of say, oh, you know, test you know, cricket's a sort of a slow sport and it's you know you don't be particularly athletic, and uh, I must admit I I probably sort of thought that a little bit myself until I. I really became involved with uh, with Test cricket, and Test cricket is brutal. I mean, that's five days in a row, and you know sometimes the bowlers have to bowl every day in that mm-hmm. five days. And so, so obviously recovery is really important, uh, you know, as to how well your your muscles and and your body recovers uh, from day to day. So. Um, some of the things that uh, that you know people do to help recovery is obviously uh, the infamous ice baths and uh, and and cool downs. Um, they tend to uh, straight afterwards they'll do a what they call a cool down, so just a light exercise with some stretching. Um, then they'll jump in an ice bath, for instance, and they might have a massage. They'll have a uh, a, a drink with uh, with sort of protein and, and uh, to to replenish uh, their uh, their supplies there. Probably some carbohydrates to uh, to fill their glycogen stores if they've been depleted and so on. So you know, there's quite a um, quite a rigmarole. It's not uh, you know in the old days you sort of a finish play and then have a few beers and you know, that was about it as far as recovery <laughs> went. But uh, things are very different uh, these days. And uh, um, so you know, cricket is one sport where really you've got so little time to recover it becomes very important. Um, in the sort of sports, you know, like, uh, you know, the various football codes and so on where, you know, you might only play once a week or in, in the case of, uh, of English football, you know, it's often twice a week. I mean, you know, again, that, you know, people want to get in sort of high quality training, you know, so the sooner you can recover and you're not sore and you're not, uh, you know, you're recovered from your injuries, then the, the sooner the, the coach can get you doing some, some high quality training. So, you know, they might play on a Saturday, for instance, and Sunday is a recovery day. They might uh, come into the club. They'll uh, do a pool session. Um, you know, start uh, swimming or walking in the, in the water. They'll have their recovery meals. They'll, uh, They'll uh, have their massage and so on. And then, you know, Monday will often be a sort of another light sort of a uh, day. And then so they're ready by Tuesday or Wednesday for, a, you know, for a serious sort of a intensive training session. And then then they uh, back, you know, back off again towards the end of the week before the game. So it's very, uh, it's quite, you know, complex and, and scientific uh, these days, but it's all mm-hmm. about you know, maximising recovery, maximising performance and uh, so on. So it's, it's a fascinating challenge and, and uh, you know, obviously some people do it better than others. Mm. And I imagine management, well, management, how it sets up that diff- uh, must be particularly important. You must, when you, you know, you're inside in the dressing room of a, of a team sport and see one manager or coach dealing with one situation and you go into another team and see another one, you think, wow, that guy is terrific. Yeah. What are yeah. some of the things that makes a manager or a coach better? Well, you know, I I, I think uh, 
one thing is is having a good team around them, you know, and, and trusting, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, having high quality people. So it's now become very scientific. You know, I mean, you know, they're, they're always wearing GPS um, yes. uh, monitors, so they know, you know, we know exactly, for instance, you know, even halfway through a game, you know, exactly how far someone's run, how much they've sprinted, how you know, all these sort of uh, it's incredible. Things. The statistics it's is mind boggling. Yeah. They wear heart rate monitors, and you know, so we we know an, an awful lot, and. Um, and so I think the good uh, the good coaches, the ones who work closely with their with their other coaches, the sports science team, the sports medicine team, um, and there's a lot of mutual uh, mutual trust and 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 quality among, among that. Uh, so it's really a sort of a team a team effort, you know, not just the the team on the field, but it's the team off the field that is uh, that is so important. And uh, and that team has obviously got to individually be all very good at what they do. But even more importantly, probably is is work closely together, um, mm. and uh, you know all know their roles and uh, and work work together because uh, you know again if you're uh, you know, if you're planning so you know we will uh, after after a game or the day after a game you know we'll do various uh, various monitoring you know so we might uh, as well as mon- having monitored their loads and so on we'll monitor heart rates we'll monitor uh, their their various aspects of their recovery. And uh, and the sports medicine sports science team might say to the coach, look, you know, there are some indications here that this player is, uh, you know, struggling a bit uh, to, with the load and recovery. You know, they might uh, so they might advise, you know, let's have you know, have a quiet training week and uh, freshen them up for the following week. Whereas you know, someone else might uh, might need much much harder work. So it's it's very individualised and um, you know very scientific. So uh, yeah. it's a fascinating challenge. It really yeah. uh, it really is. It's uh, it's very interesting. Now, Peter, in more recent years, your view on health have evolved also and I was wondering I've heard you I've heard your talks and I really have been inspired by them can you share with us that that uh, evolution yeah well I guess um, I've become particularly interested in the role of the role of nutrition in, in health over the last few years and it sort of all started off really with my own experiences I mean I, I was uh, I was actually uh, it was a time just when I was finishing up at Liverpool and um, uh, you know I I guess I, I, you know, considered myself quite healthy and and so on. But uh, you know, I'd, I'd always had a, you know, what I thought was a good diet, and I'd exercise regularly, and uh, you know, I uh, I didn't sort of have any major health issues. But um, the reality was that uh, I probably wasn't quite as healthy as I thought. I just turned sixty. Um, my father had developed type two diabetes at that age, so I was pretty aware. I didn't want to go down that uh, that track. That was for sure. Um, and I was overweight, probably borderline obese, you know, and like many sort of middle-aged men, I just steadily put on probably, you know, half a kilo a year for, for 30 years or something like that. And mm-hmm. I just gradually got to, got heavier uh, to the point where I was probably, you know, 12, 15 kilograms overweight. My kids are starting to sort of poke me in the in the belly and say, you know, come on, Dad, you know, what about it? And, and I just shrug my shoulders and say, well, hang on a minute, you know, I'm, I'm on a low-fat diet and, and I'm uh, exercising, you know, it's not my fault sort of thing. So um, – and I'd also had a few other issues. Uh, you know, some of my bloods were not that great. I had a high triglyceride level, I had a high insulin level, and I'd had a fatty liver. Um, you know, that fatty infiltration of the liver, as, as indicated by some abnormal blood tests. And I probably had that for the previous ten years. I had a bunch of blood tests over the years, and like a typical doctor, I'd completely ignored it and pretended it would go away. And figured I was on a low-fat diet, and I didn't really understand what a fatty liver was, to be honest. And uh, I just, uh, you know, pushed it out of my mind and ignored it. Um, very responsible. Yes, um, inspiring. And, you know, around that time, I um, one of my colleagues in South Africa, Tim Noakes, who's a very eminent sports scientist and an old friend of mine, he sort of started to uh, to publicise the fact that he thought we'd actually got it all wrong in that you know, obsession with, with fat over the years, and it was actually – Sugar and carbohydrates that that were, have been the problem, and uh, and he advocated this sort of low carb, high fat uh, diet, and said it had completely changed his life, and he'd uh, reversed his type two diabetes and uh, lost weight, and he was running much better than he was before, and all sorts of stuff. And 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 normally I, I don't take too much notice of uh, you know fads and so on, but I, I had an enormous respect for for Tim, and I thought, oh, that's interesting, you know, um, I should look into that. And so I started reading. I read a book by Gary Taubes called Good Calories, Bad Calories, and and that really was probably the, the book that changed my life in some ways, because um, it was a book that you know talked about uh, the relative merits of, of carbohydrates and fats and so on. But more interestingly than that, it talked about the politics of how. 
back in the sort of the 50s and 60s, you know, there were sort of these two movements, you know, one that thought that sugar was a problem and one that thought that fat was a problem. And that, that basically the, the fat people won out, if you like, and uh, and uh, and on the basis of, of no science at all, but just really political uh, connections and strength and, and the U.S. Agriculture uh, Department and, and so on. And um, and this book was really, you know, sort of really disturbing. I'd put it down at night and say, no, surely we couldn't have got something as basic as, as you know, what we should be eating uh, wrong for the last 30 or 40 years. But the more I read and then I read a whole lot of other stuff and, and I really started to question this whole mantra of, of low fat, you know, and um, – because you know when you when you when we took the low the fat out of their diet on the basis of those dietary guidelines you know back in 1980 odd and so on all around the Western world really we took the fat out but uh, we replaced that because we have to replace it with something we replaced it with with sugar basically mm. so really we we went on to the whole world went on to a low fat high sugar diet and uh, and the results have been disastrous you know we just got fatter and sicker for for 30 or 40 years so. So I, I, the more I read, the more disturbed I got. And then I thought, well, it's time for some research. And now you would know, Ron, of course, that you know, research with an N equals one is a waste of time, except when the one is you, in which case it becomes a very important research project. Mm-hmm. So I decided it was time for an N equals one experiment. And so I uh, I went put myself on this low-carb, high-fat diet, as uh, as was described, um, to uh, – I thought, I'd, let's just do this for three months and see what happens. So I did all my bloods on day one. And uh, and then went uh, – so I stopped eating all the sort of uh, things that, you know, we've all been encouraged to eat, you know, so rice and pasta and bread and potatoes and cereals and uh, soft drinks and fruit juice and uh, and so on. And, and, you know, I swapped back from margarine to butter and, and so on. And mm-hmm. I went back to sort of eating the way that probably my parents and, you know, grandparents had eaten, just, very, you know, real food and, you know, meat and fish and veggies and, and – uh, and nuts and seeds and and dairy, you know, and, and started eating eggs again, you know, because we've been told for ages eggs were, you know, mm-hmm. had a lot of cholesterol and so on. So mm-hmm. I really went back to that old-fashioned way of eating real food rather than processed food, you know, sort of threw out all the packets and and, and cans and so on. I went back to eating eating real food. And um, so, so I did that for three months, and it was very interesting. I mean, that the first thing that happened was that I stopped being hungry. So uh, instead of sort of, you know, having my cereal for breakfast and two or three hours later being starving, I, I'd have, you know, eggs and bacon for breakfast and, and wouldn't need to eat for the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. So I went from eating, you know, three meals and three snacks a day to eating two meals a day. So that was the first thing. And then I started losing weight. You know, every week I'd get on the scales and I'd just lose weight. And, you know, I was eating lots. I was never hungry. I was, you know, having these lovely meals all the time and I kept losing weight. I, just, I thought, this is fantastic. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> the more fat I ate, the more fat I lost. It was just uh, bizarre. Mm. So the interesting things happened, you know, I started feeling a lot more energetic. Um, I, I didn't, you know, have that sort of sleepiness in the afternoon that uh, that I used to get. Um, I, in fact, slept better at night. I stopped snoring, you know, all sorts of things started happening. My exercise capacity got better and so on. And um, anyway, I uh, I felt a whole lot better. And then uh, at the end of that three months, I'd, I'd lost 13 kilograms in 13 weeks, you know, without yeah. even trying you know it was just uh almost felt guilty it was just too easy <laughs> and um and and you know i my uh, all my bloods improved my fatty liver completely just disappeared so i'd had it for 10 years completely gone at the end of that three months my my blood tests were absolutely normal and uh my other blood you know my triglycerides came down and so on so i just uh yeah it was amazing. Uh, there was one drawback, though. I had to buy a new wardrobe because uh, all my clothes didn't fit me. <laughs> what a great thing to do in your 60s. No, I figured that was, you know, it was a small price to pay for, uh, <laughs> for, for that. So, And your family stopped poking you in the stomach. They did. In fact, at one stage they told me that I was getting too skinny. I thought, mm. oh, that was nice, nice to hear. But um, so, yeah, and I've, you know, I, I've sort of backed off a little bit, but I've, I've basically kept to that, uh, that diet for the last uh, seven years and, and stayed, uh, you know, pretty much the same weight and, uh, and I think reasonably healthy. And I haven't uh, – and I was clearly pre-diabetic in those days, um, you know, with the fatty liver and, and all these blood tests and so on. And uh, I've not developed uh, type 2 diabetes. And mm. I'm quite sure in retrospect I would already be a type 2 diabetic had I not, uh, not changed my – my, my diet. So, so you can probably understand why, you know, it's because of my own experience and what I read, I've become a sort of a passionate advocate of, uh, mm, mm. of these dietary changes, and in particular, reducing you know, sugar and, and uh, starches and processed foods and, and so on, and uh, and trying to encourage people to get back to eating real food because mm. you know we're really in a in a terrible way. You know, I mean, it's, 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 we just got fatter and sicker every year for the last thirty or forty years, and we need to. Uh, 
you know, I mean, I think if any if any business, you know, was their results got worse every year, you know, you'd sort of at some stage in that 30 or 40 years, wouldn't you sort of say to yourself, well, hang on a minute, you know, maybe we're doing something wrong here, you know, maybe we need to, to look at it, but we've just accepted the mantra and just continued on the same way and, and, and it's been a disaster. So I think it's time to completely re-look at the way we uh, the way we eat and the guidelines and what we should be eating. And uh, and now there are so many people who uh, who are jumping on this sort of low carb, uh, real food sort of uh, bandwagon, and and the results are very encouraging. And uh, even with uh, type two diabetes, I mean, you know, we're seeing people reversing their type two diabetes. Well, we always did. You know, we've always been told to tell our patients that you know it's a lifelong disease and there's nothing you can do about it, and you know you you're uh, you're stuck with it for life. But uh, you know now we're seeing people who can reverse their uh, their type two diabetes. So it's very exciting, right? Very mm-hmm. exciting. But you know, you now being a little more tuned into the politics of it all, would probably realise too that this low fat. Uh, dogma and and all that has been invested in it, and I'm not just talking about billions of dollars, but I'm talking about reputations, egos. Um, you know, this is something that I believe is not going to be surrendered lightly. What do you What do you think? I mean, there's there's pushback, oh, isn't there? Oh, of course there is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, and I think that's confusing for people. I wonder if you know, uh, you, you might share. What, what do you think of that? You know, and what are you well, What are you seeing out there? Yeah, well, I think people are confused. There's no doubt about that. People are confused. Uh, for a start, there, there's lots of variations of this, uh, this sort of low carb, you know, diet. There's, there's the paleo, and there's the Mediterranean, there's the Atkins, and there's you know all these sorts of things. And everyone seems to think this is the one and only diet, you know, and which is which is not the case. You know, there, there's there's no one diet for everyone. So so there's that confusion. Um, and then, of course, there's you know, as you say, there are there are many people who have their careers invested. In uh, in in the low in the low fat movement, you know the dietitians and doctors and so on who've been preaching this mantra for thirty or forty years. And it's very hard to suddenly, you know, some uh, wackos come along and say, "Well, actually, you're wrong." And you know, so you you know you tend to sort of respond to that by by being you know aggressively defensive and, and so on. So yeah. people get very uh, very uh, tight about it. And then, of course, you know, there, there's there's you know industry is it's a massive industry. The processed food industry and the pharmaceutical industry all benefit from from this current uh, dietary process, you know, we uh, processed food and, and junk food is, is, you know, is, is everywhere and it's, it's massively um, profitable uh, because, you know, you can put all these sort of cheap grains and vegetable oils and and, and call them food. I mean, I, I, you know, they shouldn't even be called food, really, some of those things. You know, they're just chemical concoctions, really. Um, and um, and, and you, they make a lot of money out of it. And, and similarly with the pharmaceutical industry, I mean, the most profitable drugs in the world are, are, are the ones that treat uh, high cholesterol, you know, the statins, and the ones that treat diabetes, you know, insulin and things. So, you know, there is there's huge amounts of money. And, of course, they're, they're not going to sort of take this line down and they're going to fight tooth and nail. And they're incredibly powerful and influential on governments, on the medical profession. You know, most doctors get their medical education from their drug reps, you know, and, and uh, or from from specialists who are, you know, whose whose business, if you like, is to uh, is to give out uh, give out drugs because that's what they know. You know, I mean, as as doctors, you know, I don't know about about your training, Ron, but I don't think I got a single lecture on nutrition in uh, very you know, rudimentary. I think and, I th- uh, yeah. biochemistry, but no actual sort of you know food, uh, you know, nutritional sort of practical nutrition stuff. And same with exercise. I don't think we ever got uh, got told about the you know the, the benefits of exercise and, uh, and and so on. So, you know, what what we're trying to do as doctors is we're trying to give medications and and, and to and to do surgery, and and that's so you go and see a doctor, and that's what you're going to get. Um, um, so, you know, it, it requires a whole sort of a change. But the problem is that, you know, that, that is, it's not sustainable for a start, you know, even financially. I mean, we're just we're, – we're basically making people sick and then throwing, you know, drugs and, and surgery at them, which is a, a very uh, – you know, it's a stupid way to, uh, to act plus a very expensive way to act. So, you know, if we can uh, go, you know, go back a step and actually get people eating properly and exercising regularly, I mean, we can prevent the majority of these diseases that, that are requiring the, the drugs and the surgery and, uh, and massively reduce the cost of, uh, of, of medicine, which is you know, getting out of control in, the, in this and other, uh, in other countries. So, you know, it, it requires a whole paradigm shift. You know, we, you know, at the moment we have an ill health system, not a health system, 
you know, we uh, we wait till people get sick, and, and it's so much easier and, and uh, more sensible to prevent people getting sick. But there's no money in that, and that's the trouble, you know. So, yep. Uh, yep. you know, uh, there's a lot of money in, in the other things. So yep. it's it's yep. a real battle. And it's very similar. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of parallels with the tobacco um, campaign, if you like. You know, the tobacco industry fought yep. tooth and nail to uh, to prevent people understanding that uh, that tobacco was harmful. And I think the uh, the sugar industry and the processed food industry are uh, are doing the same. And uh, and we need to uh, to combat that. And hopefully, it'll take less time than it did <laughs> the thirty years of tobacco than uh, it does. But I suspect it'll be something similar. Mm. No, no. I often reflect on the fact that well, dentistry, like medicine, did uh, physiology and biochemistry in its first years, and it was one of the early or second years and it was one of the early subjects which as a student you just couldn't wait to get out of you know god once i've passed this exam i never have to think about it again and what a shame biochemistry wasn't taught with nutrition and what a shame physiology wasn't taught with exercise and it would have been immediately applicable to the students sitting in the lecture theater going wow this is powerful but it wasn't like that was it no, no, no. So no, I, I exactly those feelings I hated by mm, chemistry mm. physiology because it just didn't seem to, yeah. to mean anything. It wasn't in, in context and so yeah, on. So yeah. I, hopefully these days, uh, you know, things are uh, are a bit better. But uh, yeah, look, you know, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of challenges. Mm. Um, but uh, you know, we can't just uh, you know shrug our shoulders and give up. I think we have to keep uh, keep coming away. Now, Peter, you've written a, a new book or a book of fat, lot of good, and you share in it your five golden rules for a healthy lifestyle. And you may have covered some of those already, but could you give us a brief overview of those five golden rules? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, uh, there's a, there's a you know there's some very basic sort of uh, things that I, I think that you can do to. Uh, um, to improve your health, you know, the, the first is cut back on sugar. Um, so we uh, we all have uh, way too much sugar. I mean, the average Australian has probably 14 teaspoons of sugar a day. Um, I suspect it's probably more than that, but uh, that's what we admit to. Um, and the World Health Organization, uh, you know, recommends that we do uh, we should have no more than six for our ideal health. So you know, we're well. Uh, I mean, the average Australian probably has more sugar. By uh, by nine o'clock in the morning, then then they they you know the the World Health Organization recommends you know if you have a bowl of cereal and a glass of orange juice and uh, and uh, and a bit of fruit yogurt or something you're up to about twenty teaspoons of sugar already you know in the time so yeah, yep. that's that's not good. Um, the second one is is to cut back on vegetable oils. Um, so you know they're they're not vegetable oils at all. They're seed oils, but vegetable sounds healthier, so they call them vegetable oils. But uh, things like uh, you know, safflower and canola and soybean oil and corn oil and so on uh, that are basically used now for all uh, all cooking because they're cheap. Um, they're uh, they're not conducive to good health at all. You heat those oils and they give off a whole lot of uh, aldehydes and other uh, other nasty things. So uh, um, and they completely sort of change your uh, omega six to omega three ratio, which is a ratio of your your polyunsaturated fats and so on. So we, we've really become skewed uh, in that. Uh, you know, we used to obviously our grandparents used to cook with you know with butter and lard and uh, and, and things like that. And uh, so I, I you know I, I cook in, in butter and and uh, maybe some coconut oil or avocado oil or olive oil. Olive oil is a, a exception; it's a monounsaturated fat, so it's much healthier. So so they're they're important. So the third rule I say is just eat real food. Um, <laughs> you know, just uh, um. You know, meat and fish and eggs and 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 dairy and and, and fruit and vegetables. You know, it's real food. Uh, you don't need labels on real food. You know, mm -hmm. you look at the labels; there, it's pretty obvious what they are. And uh, so, you know, I think if we can, uh, there's a great thing called JERF, J E R F, just eat real food. And yep. uh, I think that's a good uh, good motto. The fourth golden rule is is, is similar, really, is to avoid processed foods. And um, most processed foods are, uh, as I said, they're they're processed. They're, they're cheap. Uh, they consist of, of some sort of type of sugar, uh, some type of vegetable oils and some grains, and that, that combination. And, and, um, and neither of them, you could argue that none of them are good for you. And, uh, you know, I think even things that we think are, are good for you, like, um, you know, muesli bars or, or fruit yogurt or something like that, are, are actually, you know, full of, uh, full of sugar and, uh, and vegetable oils and so on. So uh, they're, not, they're not great for you. So I avoid uh, processed foods. And then the, the fifth one is to uh, is to drink when you're thirsty, preferably water. Um, so, you know, I think certainly avoiding um, sugar sweetened beverages, you know, soft drinks, fruit juice. See, people think fruit juice is healthy, and in fact, there's as much sugar in fruit juice as there is in in soft drinks. And uh, 
you know, you're better off having a, a piece of fruit and a glass of water than, than actual fruit juice because they take all the all the good stuff out of the fruit and uh, and just leave you the sugar in the water. So, uh, um, and I think this obsession with having to you know be constantly drinking, uh, yeah. there's no real evidence for uh, for that. And uh, you know, I just think you know for for thousands of years people have drunk when they're thirsty and that seems to have worked pretty well. So um, so that's what I recommend. So they're my five uh, yeah. five golden rules. And um, yeah, how um, has that now? You know, I know in 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 back into the world of uh, uh, of sports, uh, you know, how do, how has that kind of advice translated into performance? So is that some something you're taking into, you know, like in the in in the sports advice that you would give people now? Yeah, look, I think that there's uh, there's a carb loading is a big part of. Yeah, you know, carb loading was always a big part of, uh, especially endurance sport. Um, but I think people have uh, now beginning to realise that. Uh, that actually fat is a pretty good fuel, um, and it's probably not good for really high intensity sport. But for most people uh, exercising, they can uh, burn fat rather than carbohydrate. And uh, the advantage of uh, of burning fat is one that you've got plenty of it. You know, even the skinniest person has lots of uh, lots of fat, so you can, uh, um, you know, you don't have to sort of uh, replenish your uh, your fuel supplies while you're exercising the way you do with carbohydrates, and. Um, and secondly, is that uh, you know you you actually breaking down body fat, so uh, you know to use as fuel, which is a which is a good thing. So uh, so you know more and more uh, people now are realizing that uh, that we can use fat as a fuel um, at the elite level. It's still uh, largely carbohydrate. Um, although a lot of the a lot of the teams now are adopting this sort of. Uh, philosophy where they during the week during training they'll be pretty low in carbohydrates and low in sugars and, and high in fats and then they might just top up on their carbohydrates and uh, on match day uh, so it's called a train low compete high sort of philosophy that uh, is becoming popular with uh, football teams and uh, and and, uh, and high level athletes so um, you know, what what concerns me is that you know we, we've had a whole generation of athletes who've had massive amounts of sugars um, and carbohydrates, especially, you know, in liquid forms and, uh, you know, sports drinks and gels and so on. And, uh, you know, I really have concerns about their long-term, the long-term effect of that on their uh, on their uh, hormonal system and their insulin resistance and, and, and ultimately their propensity to have, you know, diabetes and, uh, and cardiovascular disease. So I think, uh, you know, cutting back on that and, and using, you know, a, a Sort of a hybrid fuel system, if you like, of both fats and carbohydrates is actually going to be better for uh, both for performance and for long term health. Because mm. I imagine another issue in recovery um, and and training, actually, just recovery from training or injury, is um, is inflammation, and uh, you know diets that promote inflammation or suppress inflammation, or fats that promote inflammation or suppress inflammation, would be quite an important and nuanced part of sports medicine now. Yeah, absolutely. I think people, you know, we're now becoming aware that certain uh, certain foods and, and activities, uh, different things are, are inflammatory, you know, so uh, leaving aside you know, nutrition for the moment. But, you know, we know that sedentary behavior, uh, stress, uh, smoking, alcohol, uh, um, you know, lack of uh, lack of sun and so on are all uh, are all all promote inflammation. And we now know that inflammation is, is really a key factor in not just sort of obvious inflammatory diseases like arthritis, but in, in things like cardiovascular disease and so on, that people believe that the, the initiating factor is probably uh, probably inflammation. So it's really important to, to reduce inflammation. And uh, and we know, as you mentioned, that there are certain foods that uh, that are inflammatory in nature, and, and they are some of the, you know, exactly the things that I've been talking about, yeah. the, sugars, the vegetable oils, the processed foods and so on, are have been shown to, to increase inflammation. And, and I've had dramatic effects of uh, on uh, on athletes, both you know, both at the elite level and and, and at the the local level, who've uh, changed radically changed their diet to reduce those inflammatory sort of uh, components to it, and uh, have had remarkable responses in their arthritis and and different uh, um, problems that they have. So um, you know that old expression of food is medicine. Uh, you know, it's not as silly as it as it sounds, and that uh, you know we're 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 you know we're really uh, looking at what we call an anti-inflammatory diet. You know, I mean people call it low carb, high fat, or this paleo or whatever, and so on. But I think you know probably the way that it really helps your health is that that anti-inflammatory component to it, as, as you mentioned. Because mm. this uh, we've mentioned sugars, and we've just kind of skirted on that word carb. 
because, yeah. um, you know, I think going back to our undergraduate biochemistry, one thing I do remember is that some of these carbohydrates get broken down into sugar very quickly, don't they? Well, all carbohydrates basically consist of, of sugars. Mm. You know, they're, they're all sugars stuck together, and uh, and some uh, some are broken down to the sugar quicker than others. Obviously, uh, the simple sugars, you know, the soft drinks, for instance, you know, they're just uh, pure sugar, really, and so they they go straight into your bloodstream as sugar. Whereas uh, something like uh, starch, like potatoes, for instance, or you know, starches uh, are broken down more slowly, but ultimately, you know, they're still uh, they're still glucose molecules, you know, mm. and uh, when they when they hit the bloodstream. It might take a little bit longer to get there, a little bit slower uptake, but it's still sugar. And, uh, you know, the, the, the body doesn't sort of say, oh, okay, you're a sugar from, uh, from Coca-Cola and you're a sugar from a potato, so you're okay, you know, and uh, <laughs> that one's not. I mean, it's all just sugar. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, complex carbohydrates are not as bad as, as, as the sugars, but uh, they're still all, all sugar. And I think if you – you know, we don't all need to uh, to stop eating carbohydrates by any means, but uh, I think if you, you know, if you do have, you know, if you're a chronic health issue, you know, you're morbidly obese or you're type two diabetic or metabolic syndrome or got one of the sort of chronic diseases, then cutting back on carbohydrates is uh, can be very effective uh, effective uh, mechanism. But um, you know, I think everyone has their their ideal amount of sort of carbohydrates, if you like, you know, yeah. and as I said, I think if you have those chronic diseases, then that's probably a pretty low amount. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you're, you know, young and fit and skinny and, and healthy and so on, then, yeah, sure, you can have some uh, some carbohydrates, uh, you know, without too many problems. But uh, I'd be avoiding the sort of the, the obvious, you know, uh, soft drinks and, and obvious sources of sugar. Now, now the word low carb means different things to different people. I know I went on to the USDA uh, site recently. You, anybody can go on there and go USDA advice for health practitioners. And I put in my age, I'm 63, and put in my uh, weight and my height and my activity levels. And then it comes up with the recommendations. Now, this is 2019 USDA. My recommended carbohydrate level was somewhere, it was between 375 and 450. Uh, grams of carbohydrate a day and also uh, as an aside it advised me to remain on low fat and avoid all foods that contain cholesterol this is 2019 Mm -hmm. Um, and then you go on to the recommended recommended daily intake of um, carbohydrates and they'll put it at 310 And, and i don't think people need to go through their whole lives measuring things out but i think as an exercise for a week or two it's good to benchmark what do you think is low carb well, certainly not that. That's for sure. <laughs> no, that's, no. That's horrendous advice. You know, I mean, yep. that will guarantee you. You know, if mm. you if you got diabetes, you will have it for life. You know, that's for sure. Yep. And uh, you're probably going to get it if you continue on with that. Um, the definition of low carb is is not that clear. It's probably some people say under 100. Some people say under 120, 150 grams of, of carbohydrate. So yeah, I, I sort of tend to look at it under under 100. You know, mm. so. Uh, I don't think anyone really should uh, should be having more than 100, 120 grams of carbohydrate a day uh, on a regular basis. You know, the odd, you know, the odd splurge I, I'm, I'm fine with. But uh, generally, um, you know, I think you should be sticking to – and if you do, and if you stick to real food, um, you you do. You know, you don't even have to, to think about it or measure it. I mean, I don't even measure carbohydrates anymore, you know, because, yeah. uh, you know, I, I just stick to the foods I know are, are low in sugar and low in carbohydrates and, I'm, I'm you know, and yeah. it's basically it's real food and I'm happy with that. But. But, um, you know, I, I think the, the extreme version of low carb, which is the, the ketogenic or keto diet that you keep hearing about from, you know, those medical experts like the Kardashians and all that sort of mob that we <laughs> take all that medical advice from, yep. um, you know, that's probably under under 30 grams, under mm-hmm. 30 to 50 grams of, of carbohydrate. And that's really when keto, what keto means is that you start becoming a fat burner in that you, instead of uh, using glucose for fuel, you use ketone bodies, which are the form of fat that we use as fuel. So hence the term ketogenic or keto diet. And uh, does everyone need to be on a keto diet? No, of course not. Um, it's, you know, it's quite, it's difficult, you know, it's not impossible. I mean, I, I didn't find it that hard, but some people find it hard to give up, you know, bread and things like that. But um, the keto diet, you know, I think if you're, as I said, if you've got a chronic disease or you're type 2 diabetic or, or uh, you know, grossly overweight and so on, a, a shortish period of, of keto diet can be very helpful. And some people find 
you know, with those chronic inflammatory diseases that you were talking about, staying on keto diet for life is, is you know, the best way to manage their uh, their symptoms. So, um, no, everyone doesn't have to be on that. Mm. But it really depends on, I think, what, there's a concept called insulin resistance, you know, So, and I think it depends on your, your level of insulin resistance, you know. In other words, how responsive your body is to to insulin. And if you're... If you're very insulin resistant, as, as the diabetics are, and, and as I probably was when I started, um, you need to be pretty strict with your carbohydrate because the body doesn't tolerate. You know, diabetes and, and, and these things are diseases of carbohydrate intolerance. So your body doesn't cope with carbohydrates. And yet, for, for you know, crazy reasons, um, the recommended diet for a type 2 diabetic is a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet, which is guaranteed yes. to continue. To, yeah, yeah to I remember the, uh, the, uh, you know, the uh, Diabetes Council was celebrating its 75th anniversary in 2000, a few years ago anyway, and they had a 10-step program to living life, and here's the key word, with diabetes, yeah. and uh, the first step was uh, include carbohydrates in every meal and avoid fat, and you didn't even have to read on to the next nine because if you followed <laughs> step one, you would indeed live your life with diabetes. That's, exactly. Uh, yes. But I think this is interesting, this level, and I think, you know, we talked about people aren't going to surrender this low-fat concept very easily because I know when some research is done, they all go, well, low-fat diet, low-carb diet has shown to be no more effective than X, Y, or Z. And you then read the fine print, and their idea of a low-carb diet is 200 grams because yeah. the recommended dose is 300 to 450. So for them, 200 is low, and that's not low at all. Uh, oh, so, right. so knowing what that is. But as you say, you don't have to go through life um, measuring. You just need to benchmark for a week or two, I reckon, or maybe yeah. a month just to get your head around what you're eating. Um, listen, we, we've covered some great territory here, Peter, and I, I just wanted to finish off now taking a step back from your role in sports medicine. Uh, we're all on this health journey through life together. What do you think the biggest challenge is for people on that journey through life in our modern world? Um, well, um, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think the great challenge that, that we, you know, w you ask anyone what's the most important thing in their life and, and everyone says it's health, you know, it's good health. I mean, that, that's really, you know, the key to, uh, to good health. And, and to me, you know, there are, there are two basic tenets of, of good health. You know, one is good nutrition and one is regular exercise. Um, and, you know, I think if you get those two things right, um, then, you know, you're really, on a, you know, all my, I won't say certain, but you know, there's no guarantees in life, you know, but, you know, you, you've, you've got a, a very good chance of leading a healthy, uh, a long, healthy life. Uh, and it's not just, you know, the length of life. It's also the quality of the life, you know, because while we're living longer, you know, it seems that our last 10, 15 years are blighted by chronic disease, in particular diabetes, and uh, and not that enjoyable. And, uh, you know, so it's pretty important to have quality of life as well as, as quantity. And uh, I think if we get nutrition and exercise right, then that's certainly the, the two most important elements, uh, along with your genetics. Um, you've got to choose your parents well. But uh, along, uh, to the two most important things to, uh, to leading a healthy life. And unfortunately, you know, tragically, really, We've been giving the wrong nutrition advice for the last 40 years, and that advice was not based on science. It was based on uh, politics and, uh, and egos and, and so on. And, and we've all assumed, as I did for many years, it was based on science. And, in fact, the science says the opposite. So we need to change our whole sort of mantra away from fat is evil to saying that uh, there are some fats that are not good, but probably not the fats that we've been avoiding all this time and that it's actually sugar and, and processed foods that are the, the problem. And if we get back to eating real food with regular exercise, that gives us our best chance of a healthy life. Peter, what a note to finish on. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great to talk. We're going to have links to your website and that, that book, and um, thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure, Ron. Now, if you are a regular listener of this podcast, keeping sugar, carbs that quickly convert to sugar low – will not come as a surprise to you. But to hear it from someone of Peter's background and reputation in the world is reassuring, if indeed you needed any reassurance. The low-fat message will not be surrendered lightly. 
Far too much money and far too many reputations and egos are at stake. You will see research which shows that low carb is not effective. But read the detail. What one researcher calls low carb doesn't necessarily mean it is low carb. Peter mentioned less than 100 grams per day, and I agree, I think that's achievable and sustainable. And as I said, you don't have to spend the rest of your life measuring carbs, but it is a worthwhile thing to do for a week or two and and just benchmark yourself. You've got to get your head around what it means. I'm also sure you will hear about lots of new and wonderful things that statins do. Incidentally, statins do lower cholesterol, but at very low doses also lower inflammation. So you can see, and that's really important for a lot of conditions. So you can see the marketing departments of drugs drug companies having a field day, keeping us engaged with this low-fat story. I'll have links to Peter's site and his books in the show notes. Don't forget to download the Unstress app, and there are some free webinars where I explore um, our current state of health, why health messages are confusing and often contradictory, and why taking control of your own health is the best alternative. Peter used that term, that we seem to have an ill health system rather than a healthcare system. And I know which one I would rather be part of, although it's good to know when things do go wrong, there are some amazing people out there to save our lives. So until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified.